yeah. we have roughly 45 minutes for questions. And if you direct your question, if you target a particular member of this panel, uh, you can use whatever procedure you like. If you want to use loaded die, uh, equal chance. I have no objection to uh, any kind of weighting you want to do. If you use a more general uh, method, uh, the, I guess what Michael would call the dust cloud method of questions, uh, that too is, is available. So we'll start with Glenn. Norm, primarily. Uh, Norm, I have to say that the Alex example, when I read it in print and now, doesn't, doesn't motivate the intuition, which is neither here nor there for me. Um, but I was curious, you describe it as concentration of risk, uh, which suggests that uh, concentrations below 100% should be treated kind of the same, that if we played with the example and it was that Alice only had a 90% chance and we, we cooked the rest of the uh, choice point, that the same thing would be true, that it's a matter of concentrating risk, not that there is a significant difference between 100% and anything else. And I was just curious whether you actually thought the phenomenon, if it exists, is one about concentration numbers or whether it's actually about something magical about moving from 100 to anything under uh, 100. I guess I, I was thinking that um, the concentration of risk mattered at various levels, so that if somebody had three times the risk, 75% versus 25%, that would matter. So I, th I think the one thing I'll say is that it would be interesting to rerun the, uh, the same setup with an example where Alice's chances are not 100%, but it's equivalent the same, and see whether it generates the same intuitions. I have a guess, against it, just a guess, that in fact something that's motivating us here is the certainty, not concentration of risk as such. You might get different results, uh, even though they're numerically and theoretically should be equivalent, that in fact they generate different intuitions. It'd be interesting. Possibly. Mm -hmm. Dan. Uh, you said you used Paul Menzel's uh, broken back. Uh, uh, it seems, I think that also applies to your application of the argument to the um, statistical versus identified laws. Uh, and, and that's because uh, you talked about the proportion of the group that can be saved. Uh, it, it seems to me that um, it could be the case that we have um, five identifiable persons uh, who need to be saved because they're at 20% risk of death. And a statistical, a, a larger group of uh, persons who are at a higher risk of death, and then the uh, the the each each of whom are at a higher risk, and then the uh, risk is concentrated in the statistical group, not in the identified group. Uh, I, I guess I have a, quick, a brief comment for each of you, uh, Michael. What would you think if uh, we looked at complaints not ex ante but ex post? and said, once the, in the California case, uh, once the um, uh, ball has gone through your, your, your spinning wheel, it's, it's fallen on someone, and that person has died. Uh, so suppose it's my brother. Couldn't I say, I have a complaint against uh, your doing that uh, because uh, my brother died for an inadequate reason, namely to save Bob's uh, leg. So we might think we can't say who has the complaint ex ante, but can't we say there's a complaint uh, ex post? And then the final, just an answer to uh, one of the questions that Nier had up there in the first case of the blacks who are at a higher risk, and you said, well, uh, who, has, uh, who has the uh, complaint there? And why not say everyone has, every black person has a complaint because their risk is 50% higher than it would have been if they weren't black. Okay. Um. Yeah. Um, uh, the strategy of the argument that I was trying to present is not to show that the criterion of concentration of risk always matters, but that it matters under some conditions. So to go back to Glenn's question, um, it might not matter under some other conditions of the distribution of risk, but it would matter under, um, if it mattered in this case, in the sense that we have intuitions that favor one outcome versus another, then that would um, 
would uh, count. And so, yeah, so I think in response to your question, it says um, uh, it might matter in some contexts, but not in others. And in this context, it seems to matter. Uh, uh, I would argue uh, to some people and maybe not to others, but that is a difference that might in fact be relevant. What, what I meant Well, well, I, I, see, I'm not sure. Remember, I was trying to test whether concentration of risk mattered. Um, and on the assumption that it was the trigger for the uh, statistical life versus identified life view. It wasn't a test of that view. Um, so taking seriously the outcome of that particular study of Jenny and Lowenstein, I was asking the question, could this matter under some conditions? Uh, not is it the proper way to uh, d distinguish these two cases. Right, so a question in, in the wheel case, right? Why not just look at the complaint ex post that the one Californian will have? Well, th there are some cases in which it seems inadequate just to focus on ex post complaints and ex ante complaints seem relevant. So Scanlon's case involving air travel, I mean, in spite of what Scanlon says, it seems that um, the, the, the fact that we know, I mean, sort of law of large numbers, that some people will die from being hit by falling planes. Um, we, we, we might say of that case, well, um, yes, we know that some people will, will die from planes falling out of the sky and hitting them. But the chances are so low that that's going to happen that we should discount it and, and not just focus on the, the, the fact of death. And so there's this presumption that has to be overcome that what we should do is discount complaints by their own probability. And in my talk, I suppose that's what I was attempting to do. And I suppose I ended up with a result, which is basically what you recommended, that in this sort of case, what, what we should just focus on is the harm that will actually occur to the one human being and compare that with the harm that um, would occur to the other human being, Bob. And so what I'm doing is actually endorsing a, a way of looking at complaints, which is actually along the lines of what Scanlon endorses and what we owe to each other. I, I'm not convinced by his particular arguments against discounting complaints by their ex ante and probability. And I've just tried to actually present a different set of arguments against discounting complaints by their ex-ante probability, but the upshot is, at least in some cases, we should focus on just ex-post complaints. Um, there's a bit of the paper I didn't read in which actually I endorse something along the lines of Johann's principle for allowing um, ex-ante complaints to figure in some cases where, where everyone sounds ex-ante to benefit. Neil, did you want to respond? Um, yeah, so this is about Dan's question. Why not say that it's unfair towards old African-American kids that this being African-American is what will cause them um, to be at um, higher risk. And, and they are, in, in as much as they are African-Americans, they are at higher risk than the whites. Um, they would have otherwise. So I, I'm sorry, yeah, of course. Then they themselves would have otherwise been. And that's exactly my answer. Uh, when I do fairness consideration, um, I, I do it comparatively. And I compare not just, you know, uh, so a sort of tort um, model in which uh, you say Bill Gates uh, would have been even richer uh, except for this one thing that uh, you did is, is not what I focus on when I uh, focus on fairness. I want to uh, focus on, on <coughs> people overall and see whether they get a fair package compared to other people, not compared to how they would have been unless I would have done something. They may be too rich uh, in the first place in some situations. Um, besides that, I also add, I mean, if, I'm not sure why it's any the more justifiable that they would be um, worse off than they are because of some coin flip. Well, it's because it's something that you think shouldn't take them worse off, right? namely being black. Uh, we might have other
they're not worse off, they're at higher risk. Yeah. But you're talking about everybody, not about the ones who... Worse but off than they would have been. It's a matter of terminology. I, I, I reserve worse off for really worse off in terms of, you know, fewer, fewer Utahs. Uh -huh. Yes, in the right mic. This is a question for uh, Mike. Um, Mike, great, great talk. Uh, two striking, I mean, a lot of detail there, obviously, but two striking features, uh, uh, at least sitting back and uh, uh, listening to it. One is the uh, assimilation of uh, anonymous deaths and statistical deaths, right? At least where the risks are epistemic. That is, uh, one case, uh, uh, we're sure that one and only one person will be caused to die. Uh, we just don't know who that is. Uh, another case, um, uh, individuals have uncorrelated epistemic risks. Uh, there's some probability that one will be caused to die, two, and so forth. These are uncorrelated. And you want to say these should be treated uh, uh, the same. Uh, uh, the second striking feature of the, of, of the talk is the separation of uh, epistemic and uh, objective risk. Um, now, on the first, um, again, as a consequentialist, I'm happy with that. You're not a consequentialist. But you want to say even as a matter of claims, they should be assimilated. So let me just make a friendly amendment. I mean, I, so you, you appeal to a principle of numbers neutrality to argue for that. Uh, maybe that's persuasive, but it seems to me independently one can appeal to a principle of non-correlation, right? Assume the individuals are mutually disinterested. They're not relative. They have no special relationships, right? Then the only difference between the anonymous lives case and the statistical lives case has to do with the correlation of the epistemic risks, right? But one could then say, well, why should, you know, whether my risk is correlated with yours make any difference to my claim, right? So again, that seems to me a further point, even within a claims view, right, why one would want to assimilate uh, anonymous and statistical lives. On the second uh, uh, striking uh, feature here, namely the separation of uh, epistemic and objective, here I sort of want to say something which I think uh, is uh, on a par with, uh, uh, you know, or relates to something that uh, uh, Nir said, which is, uh, uh, um, we may not know. Right? We may not know whether the risks are merely epistemic, that is, the underlying causal processes are deterministic and we just don't know, or whether they're deeply indeterministic. So it's a cancer. Right? Um, uh, uh, on your account, um, uh, if we can uh, um, uh, prevent the pathogen from hitting uh, Springfield uh, by spraying uh, all of uh, Californians with a carcinogen, and it turns out uh, that uh, carcinogenicity is uh, at bedrock in deterministic process, uh, uh, our view should be very different than if it turns out that uh, cancer causation is at bedrock in deterministic process. Um, I mean, number one is that seems in a way counterintuitive, but more deeply, we may not know. Right? We, we, we just don't know. So right now, given our causal models, it may well look like uh, 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 the risks of cancer are objective, but at the end of the day, they, they, may, they may turn out to be uh, merely epistemic. And so one worry is that if this is all within the constraints of review, that's supposed to be action guiding, and yet we don't know whether the underlying risks are merely epistemic or deeply objective, uh, isn't it problematic for, for the view, for the guidance that the view gives to, to, uh, to, uh, to hinge on that? OK, great. Thank you. Um, the, 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 so we, we don't know. We, we just don't know point whether the chances are deterministic or not. Well, I would reject a similar point that's made sometimes in the free will debate, right? We just don't know. <coughs> you know, for all we know, David Bohm's interpretation of quantum events could be sound and the universe could be causally determined at the subatomic level. And um, so how, how could whether or not um, we should hold people morally responsible or blameworthy depend on this fact that um, is, is something that uh, we don't know? Well, I, I reject it in that context, so I just wouldn't want to generalize that particular strategy of argument to this case. So I happen to believe that um, th there isn't actually uh, much of a difference between the, object, uh, the, the um, um, objective versus the merely epistemic risks in the cases that I was discussing. Now, as far as your first point, um, since I'm not a consequentialist, there are actually some respects in which I would want to distinguish cases depending on the ways in which the risks are correlated or uncorrelated. Okay, so just take a simple case. This is um, sort of like a, a, a diamond case, but not quite the same. So we could imagine that, um, you know, on the one hand, we've got uh, something like a roulette wheel case where, let's say there are just two people, precisely one person will be killed, 
each has a 50-50 chance of being killed, versus another case in which, well, either no one will be killed or two people will be killed. Um, well, so you know, heads, no one dies, tails, two people dies. This is a case of statistical deaths, and the other case is a case of an anonymous death. Well, I do actually think that there's a respect in which um, the case in which um, either zero will die or two will die is better than the other case because we know that the outcome is going to be one in which the harms are spread equally. So, I mean, I, this is just by way of saying that um, there are certain non-consequentialist considerations which I think should figure. Th these sorts of considerations don't really actually play much of a role in the particular cases that I've been discussing today, though. Johan. Mm. Uh, I have two critical questions for Mike ab about your roulette wheel, wheel case, but I think I first need to recap just a few things you said. So first, uh, the, uh, the unknown life dust case. There, despite epistemic uncertainty, we know that one Californian has a 100% objective chance of dying if we send the meteorite to California. And so in a competition with Bob in Boca Raton, who's sure to lose his limb, we think that this Californian has a stronger complaint against losing his life with 100% objective certainty than uh, Bob in uh, Boca Raton would have against losing his limb. But now in unknown life roulette wheel, um, there's no Californian who is objectively certain to die. Indeed, uh, their objective probability of death is just one over 40 million, right? Um, still, even in this case, you want to say that we ought to send the meteorite to, to Bob rather than to California. And in reaching that conclusion, you say you don't want to appeal to aggregation, right? Uh, aggregation of claims. What you say instead is that the complaint of an, any Californian who ends up dying is not discounted by probability in virtue of the fact that it was objectively certain that some Californian would be killed. Okay, so I have two questions about this. So first of all, I'm not sure whether you can just assume that the following two facts are morally equivalent. So fact A, which is true of uh, uncertain life wheel, uh, there's some individual who is obje objectively certain to die. And fact two, which is true in, oh sorry, fact A is true in uncertain life dust. And fact two is true in uncertain life wheel. It is objecti objectively certain that some individual will die. So again, there's some individual who's objectively certain to die versus it is objectively certain that some individual will die. I don't think you can just assume that they're morally equivalent. And the second point is that I'm not sure whether in making your argument in the roulette wheel case, you aren't tacitly appealing to something like moral aggregation, namely aggregation across different possible worlds. And I'll just explain why I think that. So to see this, just imagine a modification of your roulette wheel case in which all but one of the shoots are blocked. So there's only one individual uh, who could be harmed. He has a one over 40 million objective chance of death and all the others are at no risk whatsoever. So I take it that in this kind of case you would say that this person's uh, complaint against death is, is much, much lower than Bob's complaint uh, against losing his limb for sure. Right. So what makes the difference between this modified case and your original roulette wheel case? Well, it couldn't be the, anything to do with the prospect faced by, by uh, any individual because just like in my modified case, they only have a 1 over 40 million risk of death, right? So it can't, it, it can't be that. Um, what, what seems to make the difference is facts about what would happen to other people in different possible worlds. In my modified case, in other possible worlds, everyone would fi be fine, no one would die. Whereas in your case, in other possible worlds, there would be other people who would be killed. Well, I just wonder whether, first of all, how can this make any difference to the complaint that an individual has? And secondly, in assuming that it does make such a difference, aren't you just appealing to a form of interpersonal moral aggregation across different possible worlds. So instead of saying what the rightness or wrongness of an action depends just on how it treats individuals, you're saying, well, it depends also on what would happen to other individuals, albeit in different possible worlds. So those are my two 
two okay. questions. Right. Um, so I, I think that um, there's nothing wrong with just looking at things this way, which is we just know that in this particular case, the wheel case that I've p posited, a, a Californian will end up having this ball hit him on the head and killing him. Now, we don't know who that person will be, but it, you know, we, we do know that there will be one person who will die. And I think that th that fact is sufficient to justify our focusing on the badness of that harm to a particular individual. And so there's no sort of aggregation of lots and lots of people's very small chances. We just say, just focus on the upshot that one person will be killed. And that's something that uh, we, we know is going to happen. I mean, it so happens that that upshot is a result of having to take something like your modified case and make it the case not that the roulette ball would fall on sort of barren land if it doesn't fall on one person's head, well, that but will fall on someone else's head. Your opponents in this debate, I mean people like myself, uh, who believe that the justifiability of imposing some small risk of harm on, on many different people depends only on the prospect of harm imposed on each individual individually. They would say, you know, you're just begging the question by assuming that the mere fact that we can predict with objective certainty that someone will be harmed has the same moral significance as saying that uh, it is objectively certain that some given individual will be harmed. I mean, you can't just help yourself to that assumption in, in making your case against, against uh, people like myself. Right, so um, suppose that, I mean, there's a respect in which perhaps my approach is maybe somewhat closer to Scanlon's approach than yours, and mm -hmm. Scanlon does appeal to um, generic reasons, and there, there is an appeal to something generic, and, in, in my case. Although he says the generic reasons still have to be had from individual <laughs> standpoints, right? They can't. Yeah. That's right, yeah. And I think that, but, but you know, what he would say about this case as well is we, we know that, I think what he would say is we know that there will be an individual who will suffer this, you know, harm of this magnitude. And that's really what we should be focusing on rather than taking all these 40 million and then discounting their. Um, harms by their low chance. So could you remind me what your, your first Well, I, I just think, you know, you can do that, but at that point you've stepped outside of the sort of framework of contractualist justification. You're just appealing to the impersonal badness, uh, the fact that it would be impersonally worse if there was a death as opposed to some person losing their limb. Th that's fine, you know, then you just hold a hybrid view on which uh, justifiability to each person isn't the only thing that matters. There are also these I I impersonal concerns with the <laughs> badness of the outcome. But well, it's not so obvious. That, it's not so clear that that, that, that my view is just um, reducible to, to that, right? So, so I still want to say there's a difference between a case, it, it, even when ex ante, it's the same. Uh, the the the, the um, um, complaint that each person has is the same. There's a difference when um, the result of all these people having this complaint is that one person dies, as opposed to the equivalent of you know, 40 million people suffering annoyance. So, the, so, so there's an indifference curve where there's some amount of annoyance at losing out on the World Cup broadcast, which is the same indifference curve as that indifference curve where there's a one in 40 million chance of death. So, so I mean, my approach would draw a distinction between these cases by focusing on the fact that there is an individual who will be suffering this very great harm. Could, could you, sorry. Okay, I'll just make, yeah, one, one, one last first, try. So, if you could run me the first question as well. Since well I, so, I so you, you, you conceded that if there was only one Californian at risk of death, and his risk of death was one in 40 million, his, his complaint would be very small compared to Bob's complaint. You also said that in an intrapersonal decision, where say one person, Charlie, had to decide between either losing a limb for sure or being exposed to a one in 40 million risk of death, it would obviously be preferable to choose the one in 40 million risk of death. So you can you, you say both those, those things. So my question is just, you know, if in an individual case where I'm looking after Charlie, you know, he would no, have no complaint if I decided to impose on him a one in 40 million risk of death as opposed to uh, the limb, and his complaint would be smaller. 
and what actually happens from the perspective of any given individual in your roulette wheel case seems identical uh, in terms of the prospect faced by the individual and the attractiveness of that and, and, and so on, then how can there suddenly be a complaint uh, just in virtue of the fact that if they were lucky and they weren't harmed, it's sure that someone else would be harmed. And that just seems like aggregating. Okay, well, so those that, I mean, w w what's important is the upshot to an individual. I mean, there's, there's one flesh and blood Californian um, who would, I mean, um, it may be indeterminate who that person is, but at the end of the day, if we choose this policy, um, there will be one flesh and blood Californian who will suffer this extreme harm. And we should focus on how extreme the harm is to an individual uh, and treat that differently f from a case of lots and lots of individuals suffering a much lesser harm, yeah, even when yeah. the, for an individual ex ante, th those two prospects are the same difference. Near, you wanted to follow up. I guess it's, it's, it's a related question on just clarifying the case for me. So maybe I missed it, but is the wheel in the sky, does it have an, a strictly oh, indeterminacy so you're, so you're mechanism? I'm question. just, oh yes. Okay, right. So it's a follow up to, to Johan's. Um, oh, okay. The wheel in the sky, uh, does it have an kind of sort of quantum indeterminacy mechanism? Oh, it does. Okay, gotcha. Questions? Right, Salim. Uh, I think we're going back and forth. Okay. Okay, so I, I had uh, two questions for Mike Otsuka. First one's just like unbelievably small, but uh, at a certain point you said you'd be talking about cases where the objective and epistemic probabilities pull apart, and then you said now let's consider ones where they're together. Well, I mean, if the cases are at all realistic, like they're finite agents, I don't think they actually pull together because in order for the epistemic probability to be the same as the objective probability, you have, you have to assign epistemic probability one to the facts of the case that you stipulated being as they are. And I mean, it's controversial how to determine epistemic probability, but many people are attracted to a view where the epistemic probability that we have for almost all contingent prob propositions is less than one. Like maybe only I exist is one. So that, I mean, that's just a very, it doesn't really actually affect anything. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. Um, but a more substantive point. So you had said at one point, sort of after the bit that Johan had pressed you on, you said you, when, you, when you contrasted wheel and dust, you said you thought wheel was preferable to dust. And I guess, so wheel's the one where, um, you know, there's gonna, once you choose the option of sending this in California, there's gonna be this big roulette wheel, it's gonna determine one person dies. And if the dust that just goes out and there's the person that already has the genetic predisposition to die, right? But there's a lot of differences between those two cases. And once I imagine cases that are closer together, I, I, I had a little bit harder time getting on board with you, which made me think it might've been some of the irrelevant features of dust or, or other features that are causing it. So let's do a, Instead of dust, let's do a different version of the wheel case. So where the, <laughs> the wheel has already been randomly done. And then once it's randomly done, there's a kind of you know, hatch or something at the top of the tube. And the, the hatch doesn't open until after you choose that option. Right? So let's call that wheel one, where the, the stochastic or whatever, the genuinely indeterminate process has already happened. Somebody's been chosen. And then wheel two is where after you choose the option, then it happens. So in that case, it seems to me completely irrelevant which one you go to my feeling. I, and the appeal to the egalitarian differences seems really weird to me. If I don't know which one is true, I'm not gonna agonize over, it's not gonna make any difference to my deliberation over whether to do lost limb or that case. Okay. And if I can choose between those two, maybe there's two wheels or something like that, choose between which one I don't really care which one I go, for, which, one, which one I go for. Which makes me think maybe in, in the dust case, it's more the fact that because the person like had the genetic predisposition, it seems kind of unfair. When, I don't know, so, something else, some difference between the alternate version of the wheel case and the dust case. Okay, yeah. right. So, um, so as, as I understand the, the variation on the, on the wheel case that you presented, the, the process has already been set in motion and it's now faded which slot the ball will go down. Is that right? Yeah, that's okay. right. Right. So, um, and you want to say, well, you don't see the difference between that case and the case where um, the, the indeterministic, uh, there's an indeterministic process which hasn't yet occurred, which will set the ball in motion. Okay. Well, the, the, there is still the, the difference that um, in the one case, each person does have an objective, you know, e equal objective chance of being yeah. killed. Of course, I mean, the reason why now it seems so morally insignificant is we think this is just a matter of, of, of timing. But ultimately, that's generally true about 
um, chances. You know, at one point in time, people have chances of being killed, but then eventually, you know, one person gets killed and, and not others. Okay, um, so um, per, perhaps I mean, you know, maybe we we, we don't want to uh, necessarily have to appeal to some principle which has the upshot that we should never care about chances. Okay, um, so I think that we, we should still be. Uh, uh, attentive to the fact that there is an egalitarian spreading of objective chances of being killed in my wheel case, whereas if we choose wheel in your case, there isn't an objective spreading of risks. It's really merely an epistemic mm -hmm. spreading of risks, and I think that th does make some difference. Um, I noted that. Um, well, actually, the, the 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 thing that I noted on the other direction doesn't really actually differentiate the cases. That I mean spreading epistemic risks might have bad consequences. It doesn't really have bad consequences in this case, but, 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 but I, I think I would, I, I would grant that, um, that it doesn't really seem like much of a difference, but I think what you'd need to appeal to to say there's absolutely no difference might have two radical consequences regarding all of near might welcome these consequences, <laughs> the, the, the moral insignificance of equal chances. Yeah. In, in terms of, method, I think this, oh wait, that works. Um, in terms of methodology, suppose we find out that one of the um, explications of risk makes only a tiny difference. So, you know, you conceded that in the quadriplegia case it wouldn't make much difference. So, suppose we have two types of roulette. One is, has no quantum indeterminate mechanism and the other one is just very hard to tell because there are 40 million holes and who knows, etc. And it's really only epistemic. Um, but the one with the quantum uh, mechanism costs um, a little more. So it's not, my worry about the equal, the, the Francis Cam type cases is that when all else is equal, I stand to lose nothing from going with my moral uncertainty about my own first order belief that say objective chances don't count. Mm -hmm. And just because I need a tiebreaker anyhow, it costs me nothing. I'll go with, yeah, okay, give me, give me the quantum one. They, they cost the same. Uh, I'll go with, and that might be sleeting to lending weight to something that in truth has no weight, as revealed by um, cases where there is actually a lot of, or something significant at stake. Because we did start all of this from the assumption that the factor of fairness that we are talking about should be a significant one. Sometimes it will make us maybe, you know, uh, sacrifice some lives. All right, yeah. No, I agree. Um, my intuition is about some of these uh, cases involving equal chances and the fairness of equalizing chances are stronger than the, the weight that I, that, that I appear to think is appropriate to give in these particular cases. And I, I can't really re reconcile these differing intuitions. I mean, one thing I just mentioned so, so you, you presented a case involving the apparently indeterministic coin, but then the mint tells us <coughs> that the coin isn't indeterministic to, to motivate the claim that we shouldn't care at all whether it's a genuine objective because indeterministic 50-50 chance that one five. person will yep. die. Now, pr problem with that case is, um, well, you might think, okay, well, it's a free choice. We've, you know, uh, whom to assign heads or tails. And given that free choice, um, it doesn't really matter how much the, um, you know, whether the coin is weighted. So, so there's that, f that fact that it could be that even th when the mint tells us that the coin is actually very weighted in one direction, it's still consistent with there being a genuine objective chance. As, I opposed, to to person, as opposed to the person throwing the coin knowing. Mm. Right, so, but if... You probably couldn't read the small letters on the, but here's what the small letters said. Uh, they said, it's not heads you win. Head, it, it's actually one name on the one side and the other name on the other. All right, okay. And let me tell you about the accident, the factory. I said it was kind of in retrospect, it was inevitable. The manager doesn't quite, here's the full story that you'll find in the paper. The manager doesn't quite understand it, but here's what the, the workers in the factory told them. They told them, you know, it's complicated, it's physics, you won't understand, but the quantum mechanism was affected by the names, by, you know, one of the names saying it was longer or something, something of that sort. They didn't tell him quite what that was, who it worked against. They don't, so the manager and the allocator, nobody knows who this worked against, but it's not like the person who 
the coin was lopsided against had equal chances in the first place. It was really um, determinately against them. Well, there was a choice of going with this company and choosing this randomizing device versus another. And uh, it could be that that actually renders the objective chances equal. That they chose this, whereas they could have chosen some other factory where things would have been biased. Right, or alternatively, if, uh, if their parents, their respective parents of these two, in if the names were playing this kind of role, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if we right. found out that they had randomized the naming process in a certain way, mm -hmm. that would also, I, I silence the mm -hmm. worry uh, as, as well, perhaps. But Arthur's been patient. So, so I have a, um, a roughly contractualist worry about the, kind of the, the background setup of both Mike and Nier's account. And if, if there's some truth in what I'm saying, then I think one the results is there's a reason to think that ex-ante chances count, but a reason to not think, in general, it matters whether they're epistemic or objective, quantum or deterministic. And it goes sort of like this. But I, I think what's embedded in both of your views is, ultimately, the po potential victims here are moral patients. This is stuff that happens to them. And the decision maker is an administrator. It could be an ideal observer, but it's, it's someone who's doing something to all the patients. And though near you, and the, both of you actually use the language of what complaints they have, these are complaints that are registered to the administrator, and then the administrator, treating them as patients, treats them in some way or another. Here's a different picture. The different picture is they're all agents. They're moral agents, and whatever they collectively decide on whatever we think is the normally correct considerations is something that they do to each other. And this, this I take to be the, the ultimate, you know, very, very vaguely, is the basic Rawlsian Scanlonian setup. It's, it's something that we do together and do to each other. And now we're agents, not patients, and the form of justification is not simply appealing to what the impartial administrator is going to do to me, but rather, I'm proposing to do something to you. And if we're doing that, then I actually think the uh, epistemic, um, that, that complete. Uh, assuming that our knowledge, is, our, the level of our ignorance is justified, it's not, it's not as if we normally should have done something else beforehand to know more, uh, then the probabilities are simply the probabilities. It doesn't make a difference what the, whether it's the roulette wheel or the dust, because we have to make the decision to treat each other here and now. Um, and of course, that's going to matter for whether chances matter as well. So, so I actually think that if you shift the perspective from an administrator treating patients to agents who are treating each other, you might, now, I think what we know is there are two kind of poles that we're gonna, we're gonna rule out. We're not gonna give every single person a moral veto so that um, you know, I, I can always say, if I'm gonna be harmed in any which way, we stop the process, nor are we gonna have a strict you know, uh, utility maximizing um, solution. The, the unhelpful contractualist answer is it's gonna be somewhere in between. I, I don't have a view about whether it's you know, pairwise comparison or anything else, but I, I do think that the fact that once you take the perspective of, of the kind of the second person perspective, so to speak, uh, of that this is something we're doing to each other, you actually get different answers than you get from the perspective of the administrator. Okay, shall, shall I begin? Um, so I think if we think of uh, everyone together deciding what sort of principles they should be governed by, I think that um, the, the sorts of considerations that I offered uh, in favor of the way of treating these cases that I propose would, would be available to these people who are collectively deliberating. For example, the, the sort of reasoning, which is sort of along the lines of, of, of the reasoning that um, Matt Adler employed in order to, uh, I mean, in his case, uh, undermine the significance of, of, of chances, right? And, and, and Mark Florbet has appealed to. You know, so, so it's, it's open for all, all these people deciding what principles to be governed by to say, look, I mean, you were saying that this approach uh, moving away from the patient approach will make us more focused on ex ante. But still, we can say there are some cases in which we just know that however things turn out, for example, certain harms are going to come about. One person, and precisely one person, will die. Or um, the gap, as in Matt's case, um, in the actual utility of the people will be greater if we try to equalize their chances. Now, those are um, considerations that I think can bear on uh, the deliberate deliberations of these people trying to determine what principles to be governed by. And similarly, as far as objective versus subjective chances, well, I mean, I mean here's an argument in favor of the um, somewhat greater significance of objective chances. So, so, so John Broom uh, has this piece on fairness, and he says, well, if, you know, when people have equal claims on a resource, then if you can divide the resource equally without loss, then 
you should divide the resource equally. What if you can't? Well, at least you can give them each an equal chance of this indivisible resource. Um, and then one thing he says is, well, at least if you have an equal chance, you know, you've got some chance of getting the resource. Now, that's true if we're talking about objective chances, but it's not true if we're talking about merely subjective chances. So in other things equal, better to have um, a 50% objective, not a 50% epistemic chance of getting this resource on which you have an equal claim, because at least you've got some chance. So, so, so I think, you know, e even if we're uh, collectively deliberating as agents, we can still make arguments like that to differentiate objective versus subjective chances. This is me. We may not share intuitions. I think that if you carefully control uh, the sources of the knowledge, well, we'd make those art. We'd, it would be raised, but then we'd both agree. You know what? It really doesn't matter. But I, I, th I think this is just we're, we're just not agreeing about the, some of the fundamental uh, in, insights here. Okay. Nir? I'll, I'll just add briefly that um, I mean I did say something about the candidate's perspective as, as a, you know exclusively the candidate's perspective, which is not exactly what you had in mind, but it seemed to only kind of muddy the water to to um, in that context at least to hear what they have to say because they can be mis completely uh, misled about their chances. Um, I'll say that one approach to this could have to kind of, you could, or you could use my paper in the following way. We need, if we focus on subjective chances or whatever, we need to go through subjective, subjectivity of whom? And there would be a variety of agents. I covered two types of agents. You could probably talk also about third parties or. Um, all these agents sitting together. Once you do all that, um, you will come up with um, some answer as to what's the relevant interpretation of probability. Um, and what I'm trying to do is to say, once you do that, um, it's not going to, there, there will be this or that problem in applying fairness to that. So what I'm trying to say is it's, in a way, in diff unimportant what's fundamentally driving you. Once you determine its chances as understood in this standard way, in that standard way, etc., then problems arise for each of the kind of major possibilities that people have discussed. L let me briefly ask it a different way and then just leave, leave you to either answer or not. D does it make no moral difference whatsoever whether or not this is something that we're doing to each other as opposed to something that someone else is doing to us? Well, actually, it's, it's interesting that in Mike's examples, uh, Mike's examples were very different from, from Norm's examples and my own examples because in Mike's examples, the person being killed was being killed by us. Mm. Mm. For some people, all that makes a whole lot of difference. And it's open. We didn't, I, you know, I never kind of worked on Mike's type cases. Maybe some intuitions are very different there when it's us doing the killing. Who knows? Yes. Thank you. Um, just uh, to introduce uh, a different point of view uh, that might be wrong, but is, in my case, for the sake of learning, is the question uh, and, and how the uh, ethic will affect the decision-making process. So my question is, where is the person making the decision? Because if the patient, if the person making the decision is in Bermuda, and the, um, the uh, person that might die is in California, and the person that might lose his limb is in Florida, both are unknown to him. So he is not identifying neither one of them. So in that particular case, he would be comparing a limb with, a, with a, the life of one person. Um, so I wonder, you know, what do you think about that? So I'm assuming that the um, person making the decision, oops, I'm assuming that the person making the decision is of, um, does this one work? Okay. Uh, I'm assuming that the person making the decision is a federal government official of the United States. Um, I suppose it might make a big difference whether some people are outside of 
the United States and others are inside the United States. But um, you know, uh, the and he doesn't know the the individuals, um, of right? Um, He's comparing limb with, with uh, th That's right. Yeah. So, so I mean, th I'm just sort of holding that f factor of special ties equal in this particular case. The only thing that varies is well, knowledge. Uh, in advance of who will suffer the harm, and also the, the harms themselves are varying. Norman. Well, actually, my, it's not a response to this question, so it's, uh, but we should, yeah, uh, yeah I, I wanted to, in response to the question Salim asked before, Nir, if I remember, said, um, well, we could have modified the example of the, um, Coin flipping by uh, by having an uneven probability of one name being on, or the name coming up on one side rather than the other, but in that case, would people judge the coin toss as equally fair in the way that uh, where where there was a you know uh, a question about who would call what head, and that was uh, presumably unknown and 50-50 um, and, uh, probability. So if the balancing act between the heads was that anybody could throw that coin and it was simply what name came up, then nobody, would, it strikes me, would judge that as a fair toss. Um, uh, on, uh, on the other hand, if um, uh, one was still having a 50-50 chance of calling the heads or tails, and then we see which name comes up, then that's a different story. So just to clarify, what, um, so in the example, they thought that the coin was great for objective fairness in two ways. They thought that it was both um, even and special quantum mechanisms, so kind of indeterminacy uh, keeps the even chances really, really, in the strictest sense, even chances. In fact, the coin is both with a determinant outcome. So in a deterministic world, it's objective by Mike's light. There is no objective 50-50. It's a, objectively, it's 100 versus 0. And it's just um, uneven. So you know, one of the sides is much heavier. And in nine tosses out of uh, 10, on average, it falls against one of the contestants. What the example suggested is, so long as they don't know who it's uneven against, no big problem. They've no, no special reason to go to Western Mass, although life and death is at stake. So um, <coughs> you're saying we still don't know which name is? They don't know which. Um, yeah, but it, uh, then it, uh, right, the yeah, details of the name. example matter, it seems to me, because if the coin is simply uh, flipped and whichever name comes up is the winner or loser, mm -hmm. then, uh, and we know the coin is unbalanced, then we shouldn't make uh, the judgment that it's a fair toss. It's not, so we wouldn't call it a fair toss, we wouldn't describe it as a fair coin. Um, the word fairness um, is a word that is applied in a variety of ways in this context. Um, I think that we would say that to use that unfair coin in these circumstances of ignorance would be a fair thing to do. I, I don't see that. <laughs> the person that loses, Sir? Yeah. Uh, and, and then he's told, actually, you had a 90% chance of losing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we might tell it to them in advance, right? That's what happens in the thin veil of ignorance. That's what's happened also when we pull straws. One of the straws is already longer than the others. It's determined. Well, uh, but, you know, the person says, but well, we ask, you know, well, you don't know. Is, that's good enough. That's that, good. Just the in that the case, there is the it was in advance, but in this case, that's what um, it, it, it was inevitable. Yeah, well, consistent. Most with Most people the, have my intuition on this. Um, Given the, the well, I, 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 I'm often outvoted in this world, but uh, it doesn't. <laughs> Given the sheer number of tragic cases you faced, I'm going to cut off questions, unfortunately. But thank our panelists, especially uh, Michael Atsuka, for defending Californians as a fellow Californian. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right.